Well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's uh, tonight. Uh, public lecture is organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and we are very pleased and uh, honored to have um, Professor Larry Shep as the speaker today. Um, Professor Larry Shep is renowned for his pioneering and fundamental contributions to discrete topology, tomography, and for his work on applications of probability, statistics, and mathematics to physics, engineering, communications, genetics, and mathematical finance. His work in tomography has a profound influence on biomedical imaging with important applications in medical X-ray and nuclear magnetic resonance technology. He's a member of the U.S. Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, which is called Institute of Math Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. For his research in stochastic processes and computer tomography, he has won awards and recognition from major scientific and professional bodies such as IEEE and Institute of Mathematical Statistics. He's actively involved in editorial work and services for leading journals in probability, imaging sciences, and computer-assisted tomography. Now, I first met uh, Larry as a student, and I told him this afternoon that he was formidable, awesome for me, because he was so smart. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, it takes so many years for him to, to come to visit Singapore. Uh, you know, Larry was, uh, was uh, working with um, uh, the, um, the uh, what, uh, at Mar Mar here with uh, uh, this uh, Bell Lab uh, for a number of years before he was uh, a sort of professor, he said, he told me, a professor at Stanford and then at Columbia before he became uh, a professor at Rutgers University. And since 2004, he has been the, uh, the Board of Governors Professor of Statistics at Rutgers University. And um, he told me that he is going to be very controversial tonight and could be even offensive at times. So I told him not to worry and say everything because since I invited him, you can blame me and not him. <laughs> it is now my great pleasure to invite Larry to deliver his uh, lecture entitled Data Mining with Modeling Managing Diabetes. Larry. Thank you very much, Lois. Can you hear me? Good. So uh, I, uh, this is a bit of a polemical talk, and I'm on a crusade these days to uh, try to move uh, statistics, uh, which I'm not a statistician actually, which makes it even worse, uh, <laughs> uh, back toward <coughs> collaborations, inspiration, interaction with the rest of science. It's tended to become isolated uh, due to uh, a, uh, well, we'll talk about exactly why that happened. And uh, then, in order to drive my point home, uh, that people really would be better off to actually think about the problem that they're working on, rather than <laughs> as if that needed uh, much. Uh, convincing, uh, rather than to simply use uh, uh, cookbook methods that uh, somebody told them works uh, and it can't possibly work. I mean, think of it this way, that if you have to really, if you use the same method on ten problems, uh, then uh, it can't really be any good on any one of those problems. Somewhere on each problem, you should use something special to that problem to solve it. And uh, that's my main point, and it's a, almost a trite point, except that we have gotten ourselves into a situation in statistics where uh, there are so many people at very high levels, even in leadership, that are advocating these types of very simplistic approaches to very hard problems and they're going to translate uh, languages and they're going to do everything 
with just uh, regression or uh, with uh, they're going to recognize images and tell uh, one from another, uh, uh, men from women or cats from dogs, just by ha applying methods, data mining methods that really don't use anything from the real world uh, that's specific to the problem. So that's really what I want to talk about. Okay. So uh, now, when everybody, anybody tells you anything like that, you have to be careful. And uh, I'm going to try to justify these strong words, although to me it's almost a truism and an obvious thing. And then uh, you can decide for yourselves whether, whether I'm right. Anyway, it's kind of, uh, I think, the duty of a, an old person like me to uh, try to do some uh, tilting at windmills and uh, uh, try to convince young people to uh, take a different point of view. This is actually the point of view I grew up with, so it's an old point of view, not a new one. Uh, so the question is, should one allow the data to speak for itself? Which is the words that came along when Tukey began to criticize mathematic, overly mathematical treatments uh, or methods in, in statistics in the 60s and 70s, uh, exploratory data analysis. Or instead, should one inject one's preconceptions by choosing a mathematical model? And it's a philosophical thing, and, and I'm going to mainly be philosophical, but then in order to put some real content in the talk, I will discuss diabetes, which is a very interesting problem that I'm working on. And it's a work in progress. So the question is, I, and I hope most of you will have a, an idea of what I'm talking about, but I'll explain it as I go along. So should one solve all problems at once? Typically, you'll see a lecturer, and uh, maybe you'll notice it next time if I bring your attention to it. And he comes in, he gives a lecture, and he's talks, he says he's going to talk about a specific real-world problem of statistical type, class, a classification problem, or whatever. And you soon realize he's not even interested in the particular problem that he's, that he's talking about. He's talking about a method, not a problem. And if you ask him details about the specific problem he's talking about, you won't get them because he's never really looked at the data. He's just taking... He's just taking, uh, uh, trying to develop whether, to see whether L1 smooth is, L1 regression is better than L2 regression, or whether uh, 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 dimensional analysis of one type or another, uh, eigen, eigen expansions in one way or another is better than this, or, or, or shrinkage uh, estimation is, is better. And he's using the same methodology uh, on every problem, and in each case it has nothing specifically to do with the problem. And the, and the criticism of somebody who tries to actually solve a problem is, oh, he's used ad hoc methods. What's wrong with ad hoc methods? Ad hoc at least deals with the problem. I mean, it's nice to be elegant, but ad hoc is, should not be such a bad word. And why does one have to solve more than one problem at a time? I've actually had this discussion with senior people. He says, oh, it's really great. You solve more than one problem at a time. That's much better. I, don't th I think it, if you're really interested in a problem, you just solve it. And if you don't have a problem, why are you bothering me with it? Why don't you just, I mean, what are you talking about? So anyway, problem-oriented is the way to be. I think if statistics persists in this way, students will be turned off, and sooner or later they'll realize that there's nothing, there's no content here. And they will uh, leave the field of statistics. Moreover, statistics will look pretty dumb, because you're never going to solve a problem with those general methods. And they'll get the wrong answer enough times, and people will ignore them. And if it will not, the only way that statistics can grow, the only way that mathematics can grow, is if it works with other interdisciplinary subjects and uh, 
it borrows ideas from the real world and gets insight from the real world. And that's, that's the point of view of a, an applied mathematician. Uh, statistics is already beginning to sound like some religion uh, because it's, it's elevating methodology to a high degree. I hope I don't insult anybody when I attack religion, but I can't help myself. Okay, so let's review some of the reasons that data mining, as it is usually practiced, has gotten us into such a situation. I blame it on two root causes. One is the uh, campaign of John Tukey, and I don't mean to compare myself with John Tukey, he was much stronger than me, uh, I knew him very well, but he, he was a real genius, and the fact that he promoted exploratory data analysis uh, saying let the data hit you between the eyes, he had interocular vision or something, and getting rid of mathematical modeling for fear of prejudicing yourself. I think he was right to do that. At the time, we used to talk about it. He was at Bell Labs, I was at Bell Labs. He was about five uh, executive levels higher than me. But he respected me and I respected him. We had many, many good discussions. He didn't use exploratory data analysis. I'm 100% sure. He just inflicted it on other people. That's all. He, that's ridiculous. Uh, all of that, mo just drawing a graph and expecting the data to hit you between the eyes. That's not going to happen. It ain't going to hit you between the eyes. You've got to think. It's easy to use those methods, but they're not, it's not wise. Uh, the other big success that helped, or that I think encouraged people to look for quick and dirty, non-thinking ways to attack, is the illusion that Google does its magic, and indeed it does magic. It's changing the world completely. Uh, everything is out of date now. Nobody needs encyclopedias, libraries, books, everything is completely changed. I was amazed too. And how does Google do it? Do it? Does it use something from the real world? It certainly doesn't seem to be doing anything domain specific. It doesn't seem to understand what it's looking for, and yet it does it. Um, there is one possible explanation, that it actually has a very clever idea, uh, which is that it's using links to web pages that other people have set up, so therefore it's exploited the picture of the world given by other people, which is a very clever idea and would, in, in my understanding, be uh, some way that they've exploited something intrinsic to the problem. I'm not sure how Google works. It certainly works well. Uh, sometimes a problem is so difficult. For example, a problem that you guys have here and we have in the United States is trying to find who the terrorists are by overhearing their conversations. How, do you, how would you do that and cull the number of conversations down to a so small number so that you could then actually eavesdrop on them and understand what the, which ones are actually terrorists? You need, a, you need a human being to understand it. But even to determine the language that's being discussed, that's being spoken, is not such an easy problem. In spoken speech, in written, in written things, it's easy, but not it's not not spoken language. And it's the, in a problem like that, you might throw up your hands and you might say, "Well, you know, you just have to use machine language tools or neural net tools. You can't really help hope to do it." And I don't even think it's true there. I think thinking will help you there, although it is difficult. So I'm going to illustrate my point with two data mining type examples. And uh, my intent is really to draw your attention to the difficulty that statistics is in now. Although well, you might not agree. Uh, and then I will talk about some real problem that I think is very important. Uh, so I'm here mainly to urge data miners to think a bit about what they're doing that more attention to be paid to using other fields of science and mathematics so that statistics can grow and not use the same techniques on every problem. And uh, 
I'm going to introdu- uh, uh, illustrate this with a couple of examples. One is a, an example that's not my own in uh, uh, machine learning or neural nets, and the other one is diabetes management. This is a real problem. It's new. It's, it's a current thing, and I want to show you how you can use mathematics to make a contribution, which is so much more enjoyable, by the way, than using the same old method on, the, on some data set you're not really even interested in. Uh, <clears throat> first, I'd like to talk about some, a couple of Gedanken examples, just to show how difficult it is. These are not real examples, they're just thinking examples. I, I often tease the neural net community by asking them to design a neural net that would take, say, a CT, computer tomography, emission tomography, or MRI reconstruction, whoops, uh, and try to find a tumor in it. That's possible. You can, you can begin to uh, look for sort of circular blobs, although tumor is not always that way, but it might work. But suppose you actually brought it back to the raw data. You know, in, in emission tomography or in, especially in, in CAT scanning or CT scanning, you take line integrals and then from those line integrals you try to solve the equations that would allow you to reconstruct the uh, uh, the uh, electron density of the uh, of your brain, say, as you by inverting a radon transform or solving a bunch of equations. Uh, you might call that discrete tomography, and, and Lewis did, but uh, I would just call that inverting radon transforms, and. That's uh, an important thing, and you have to kind of know some mathematics. Uh, you have to know some Fourier transforms or something like it to solve it, or Radon did it without Fourier transforms, but you, you, know, you have to, this, it's not a completely trivial thing. By a formula. You could do it in sort of a blind way by just trying to solve a bunch of equations iteratively, and you would get, eventually, you'd, you'd get a reasonably good reconstruction. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I won't uh, bore you. But I, what I would do is I would say, okay, you guys in the machine learning community, let's say you learn how to find whether a tumor is present, not from the reconstruction after mathematics has come in. Do it with the raw measured data before the radon inversion has taken place. I mean, it's pretty obvious that that's impossible. It's so hard. So I challenged them to do it. And sure enough, they were stung, so they went off to try to do it. And they wrote a neural net way of going about doing it. Some of them did. And the way they did it is they used the essential form of the uh, algorithm, as was found by by radon inversion, and then twiddled just the filter function that you use. And even then, they had great difficulty. So it's very common in the, in the neural net community to guide the neural net. Originally, it was set up by Hopfield and others to try to discover uh, something uh, as the mind somehow mysteriously works. Uh, uh, perceptron-type uh, uh, logic is going to make it work. And, uh, but at the end of the day, what they do is they really know how to do it because somebody actually thought about it and did some mathematics, and then they try to follow down the same path. That is, uh, I would say, not completely honest. So that's another Gedanken uh, problem. So another Gedanken example is to comp program a computer to recognize whether a given picture of an animal is that of a dog or that of a cat. That is not really an even a, a well-defined problem. A mathematician would ask, what, what is a dog? What is a cat? I, mean, uh, I just came from a meeting in Hong Kong in which they were talking about how to recognize an elephant. They never defined an elephant. And do they mean an Indian elephant or an African elephant? And these things that seem so real to us because we live in the world and we think we know what an elephant is, try to define an elephant. We don't know how we do it. It's a very hard problem. And uh, these things are difficult. I think that 
a statistician would have, be hard pressed to try to tell a man from a woman. I think that's not such an easy question. And if you pick your dates uh, with a machine learning algorithm, you're going to be a bisexual, I think. So, uh, it's, these uh, neural nets are probably not the way to go about doing these things. And, and these problems are hard. Uh, but maybe there are other ways to do it if you think about it. Uh, so I would argue that each particular problem of pattern recognition should dry, should bring a, something from the real features of the real world that you can see and uh, to then find an algorithm to look for that feature. Tukey might argue just the opposite. He advocated looking at the data of a particular classification problem without trying to model it so as not to prejudice yourself with preconceived ideas. Well, that's kind of a little bit rough. So here's an example. Let's get more specific. Consider the problem, which is a standard problem in statistics or classification theory, of let's make it relatively easy. People write on envelopes numbers 0, 1, up to 9, and they then uh, write an algorithm. Sometimes they put little boxes to guide the user to write it more standardly. So let's say they do that. Let's say it's a 16 by 16 array of little boxes. And then you can scan it in. Uh, and if there's any uh, uh, pencil marking or pen marking in a particular one of the 256 squares, 16 squared, 16 times 16, 256 squares, you call it a 1. And otherwise, you call it a 0. And you get for every squiggle that people make, you get a, a uh, a vector of zeros and ones uh, in 256 dimensional space. And the, uh, the, the object is to write an algorithm that would go from that vector of zeros and ones that might be produced and would produce the, what was intended to be written uh, there. And you might have a training set of, say, 10,000 numbers. This is a very old problem. And it's called the post office problem. And the, the situation was people at Bell Labs worked on, on that. There was a number of statisticians that uh, came up with algorithms based on regression and things like that. And uh, they were getting error rates of about 2 or 3%. So they got 98% of the numbers written correct, which is nowhere. I mean, the letters would be flying all over the place with a thing like that. That's a terrible error rate. So Tukey, Vardy, and I were at Bell Labs. Va this I originally prepared for a talk by, by uh, Vardy, who died. And that's where this thing first appeared in my talk. And uh, so. One of the engineers at Bell Labs thought about the problem instead of just using a cooked cookbook algorithm like, I don't know. Uh, and one of the people in the department, the stat department, Trevor Hasty, who had worked on it, was stung by the fact that Patrice Simard, who was the engineer, had gone from 2%, 3% error rate to essentially 0% error rate. How did he do it? He thought about the problem. And I'll tell you how he did it. It's very simple. And it's a beautiful engineering idea. Perfect. What he did is he used something of the problem. And here's his idea. He thought to himself, well, Instead of looking for the nearest point in L1 or L2 or L3 halves in the training set, which was what Trevor was doing and others, it was great Trevor's credit to actually invite him to give a talk because it's kind of embarrassing when somebody solves your problem. But the story gets ugly. Uh, here, this was Patrice's idea. He said, 
The guy could have been using a pen with a thicker, uh, with a thicker tip or a pencil that wasn't sharpened quite as much. It could have been a thicker letter. It would have produced the same thing except that it would have filled a few more of those pixels. Or maybe he, had, he could have hold, held the paper in a slightly different position and, and the, uh, uh, it could have been rotated inside the 256 thing. Or it could have been translated in either direction. And there were seven such transformations that could have been there if some thing had been slightly different. So what he did was this, and this is, I think, just so clever. He thickened each uh, number in the training set. He, he rotated it slightly to another position, and he uh, translated each one slightly up in both ways and so on. And doing that, since there were seven transformations, he got seven new numbers for each of the original 10,000 numbers. He got seven new numbers uh, that could have been the one that was written if the situation was slightly different. So now he has the original, for each of the, the 10,000 numbers in the training set, he has eight points in 256 dimensional space. He's got the original and each of those seven distorted things. Those eight points determine a seven-dimensional hyperplane in 256-dimensional space. And he's got now 10,000 seven-dimensional hyperplanes. You know, eight points determine a seven-dimensional hyperplane. Now comes the new number, not one of the 10,000, and he finds which hyperplane is closest to that new number. And he announces that the number that goes with that hyperplane is the, most, is, the, is the one that he's going to classify the new number as. Is it clear? No errors. More precisely, it had an error rate. And, but if you look at the errors, even a human being couldn't recognize that squiggle. You know, some people write numbers in a completely very crazy way. You couldn't tell the number was. I consider that zero error rate. I mean, when, when a human being can't recognize it either, you can't really blame it on this algorithm. I mean, that's ridiculous. So he had no error rates. Okay, now you would think that everybody would stand up and applaud, and that's exactly what I did. I said, this is great. Here's what really is really annoying about this thing. I said, the only thing is, why do you want to call this neural nets? Why do you want to say you did this with neural nets? This is an engineering idea. This is, this is real. You got an idea here. You thought about the problem. You brought in something from the real world to solve it. It was specific to that problem. Why do you call this neural nets? And he says, well, because it is neural nets. And he looks up in the back of the room, and there's his boss, the head of the neural net department. <laughs> Wait a minute. So then I say, uh, well, I, you know, this is ridiculous. And what happens after that is even said. The neural net department finds a way to do zero error rate with neural nets. And they say, well, it's much faster than Simard's algorithm. But of course, what they did was they guided their neural net down the path somehow in mysterious ways of whatever uh, Patrice was doing with his idea, with his real idea. Wouldn't it have been more profitable to try to make Patrice's uh, uh, numerics for dropping all the 10,000 perpendiculars faster? They can do that. Let the computers, computer guys work on that. That's what would have been great. Five years later, Patrice has left Bell Labs and he's working for Microsoft, and he's not so interested in the post office problem. And I said, look, we have, a, we have an imaging journal. Would you write a paper describing the whole thing so we can really expose these neural net uh, scandal? And he says, what do you mean? I did neural nets. That was neural nets. And even then, he was still insist, even today, he still insists that neural nets is the way to go with this problem. And so does Trevor, and I mean, this Completely crazy. So I feel like, you know, I'm a voice in the wilderness. 
Okay. So I think Patrice solved the problem with a brilliant engineering insight that took advantage of the fact that there are mathematical invariances present in the problem that he could exploit. It's obvious. The image of the number being written depends on how much ink is there to pen and so on and so on. So on. I don't want to repeat that. Okay, so this type of inputting something from the real world, it's ad hoc -y. yes, so what? It's brilliant. Good, okay, so we talked about that. And the sad part of the story, and I just said that, so I won't repeat it. Okay, so now I'm ready to move on to diabetes. Uh, I think Lewis thought that more people would come if I spoke about something uh, to do with diabetes because people would be interested. But I think the problem is that in Asia, uh, diabetes is not such a big problem as it is in the West. There's more diabetes in Western genetics. And I'm talking about type 1 diabetes. There's type 2 diabetes probably here too. But type 1 diabetes is a is a, a di is a disease where uh, it's an autoimmune disease where uh, your T cells have killed your beta cells and you make no more insulin. So a type 1 diabetic makes no insulin. Insulin is needed to uh, open the uh, receptors in uh, cells in the body to sugar. Uh, without opening those receptors, the sugar can't get into the cell and the cell can't use its ATP and whatever to get, generate energy to do its functioning. And the, what's worse than that, the sugar that's in the bloodstream builds up and uh, eventually uh, gloms up your capillaries and you have terrible consequences. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's the problem of type 1 diabetes, but what we're going to talk about is something really very interesting, I think, at least to me. Uh, insulin nowadays uh, can be delivered by injection or by an insulin pump, and you'll, I'll show you some slides. Uh, you can, people wear insulin pump, and the insulin pump can, uh, sits in the subcutaneous fat, there's a needle into subcutaneous fat, it doesn't go right into the bloodstream, because uh, if it did, then germs could find its way into the bloodstream, but it sits in subcutaneous fat, it has to be moved every few days, excuse me, and it, in, it inputs a precise quantity of insulin, which has to be, of course, uh, replenished in a well in the pump, and uh, it's under computer control. You can put in one unit, half a unit, or even a fraction of a unit, a small fraction of a unit, and that's technology number one. Technology number two, uh, which is developed only recently, is a continuous monitor of blood sugar. And that's worn also in subcutaneous fat, and I'll show you a picture of it and I'll discuss a little bit of how it works. And the, the, the problem, which is a statistical problem in essence, is to uh, find an algorithm that would tell the pump how much insulin to deliver at any given moment depending on the readings in the continuous glucose monitor. A nice, nice ap possible explana a, a, a problem for, for statisticians. And I am working with one of the companies that are involved in this thing. So let's talk a little bit in general about diabetes, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. Uh, and I think the best way to do that is for me to move over to uh, my co uh, colleague's slides, who's at Medtronic. And I'll show you his slides because he it's really quite a bit better. Now, what am I supposed to do? Hit, uh, how do I do this? You just told me and I forgot. Uh, so I want to get back. Control L. Is that what you said? Control L. Yes, I skip. Yeah. Okay, very good. Okay, let's get back to, uh, which one do I want to go to this one? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so these are uh, Caesar Palerme works for Medtronic. Medtronic makes both 
the pump and the uh, glucose monitor. And he, we had a little uh, seminar uh, in February on this problem, and Cesar lent me his slides. So this is type 1, and it was a serious problem. People were dying like cra in crazy because the sugar uh, screws you up uh, if it's, you get blind and so on. It's ugly. Uh, the costs to society are very big. Uh, you get liver disease. You get, it's gruesome. So what you want to do is you want to avoid highs and you want to avoid lows. If you go too low, now what is low? Well, blood sugar readings are measured in milligrams of sugar per deciliter of blood. Normal people have around 100 milligrams per deciliter at any given time. Uh, if you go, say, down to around 80, you get hungry and you eat something, and that increases your sugar content, and it moves up. If you get up to around 120, something is detecting that, and it stimula a hormone goes out to the pancreas, and the beta cells are uh, stimulated to produce insulin, and the insulin goes directly into the bloodstream rather than through the subcutaneous fat, and the blood sugar level goes down because the insulin opens the cells and the cells use uh, insulin. Now, an algorithm, okay, so let's stick to the general stuff. So you can be hyperglycemic if you're too high, you can be hypoglycemic if you're too low, and if you go down, say, to 30 milligrams per deciliter, you have a seizure and you could die. Bang, instantly. So you don't want to go too low. If you go really high, like 600, you can get a seizure and die instantly. But before you, uh, before you go too low, the, a, your body mechanism will stimulate your liver to dump sugar, stored sugar, uh, glucose from the liver by a hormone glucagon that tells it to do that. So, so um, you will, that will prevent you from dying uh, ordinarily uh, if you have any, uh, if you have any uh, sugar stored in your liver. And of course, if you if you're starving, then that's where you that's what, probably why you die. Uh, but if you if you don't have the stored uh, sugar. If you go too high and you're a diabetic without insulin, you, you're just going to die. You'll go up above 600 and you die. And that's what would happen typically before a diabetic got it to be 21 or something like that, before uh, some genius discovered uh, insulin. The first insulin pump was a, kind of a monster, uh, the guy on the left, but eventually you've maybe seen people running around with these things. And, and it could be type 2 or type 1. That's, a, that's an insulin pump, and it's sitting in subcutaneous fat. And it's under computer control, and it, like I said. Uh, typically, the diabetic is under human control. And the human algorithm for deciding how much insulin to put in works like this. There's a, at each meal, before the meal, you will inject or infuse through the pump a bolus of insulin because you know you're going to eat. You know you're about to eat. If you are going to exercise after you eat, that's going to use up some sugar you might cut back on the amount you bolus. But a decision is made. How much insulin, one unit, two units, whatever. A decision is made by the human being. In addition to that, there's a basal infusion rate, which is a steady drip, drip, drip from the pump, which you can't do with a, with a uh, uh, needles. It would be too many injections. So you can't do a basal, but 
the people who are running around with pumps, they can do basils, and you can program that. And at, uh, you might uh, adjust your basil before the meal here, or you might, uh, at night there, you might really lower the basil, because you don't want to go too low during the night, because that's when you, the diabetics can get into trouble. And in general, it's really a pain in the neck, if you're a diabetic or if you're a parent of a diabetic, to have to think about it all the time. You, typically, you'd be testing many, many times a day to try to keep yourself in the bounds. And that is extremely tedious. If this could all be done with an exterior pancreas, an exterior um, blood glucose monitor, somewhere there's a blood glucose monitor in the, blood, in, the, in the normal human being, but we don't know where that is. And uh, there's a, uh, that's telling how, how high the, uh, how, how many milligrams per deciliter is done, and, but it's all done in automatically on normal people, and they stay between 80 and 120 or 70 and 130, something like that. The people, I mean, all normal people are like that. And this bolus is uh, not done by the system, which doesn't know when you're going to eat. It's done automatically if you're normal. Uh, so in the old days, people, or even today, most diabetics, especially type 2, use uh, finger sticks rather than the glucose monitor. But this is the glucose monitor, this thing right here. And that's a very small thing, and it's sticking in subcutaneous fat, typically on the other side or in the back. And there is a means for communicating with the pump, but so far this doesn't have approval in the United States at least. I don't think it has anywhere. Uh, it's a very new problem, very new technology. And that's the problem that we are really working on. And uh, it's work in progress, but we're, we're making good progress. Uh, the technology behind the uh, continuous glucose sensor, this thing right here, uh, is um, rather clever and quantum mechanical. It's imagine trying to find out how much sugar there is in the bloodstream when you don't actually have access to the bloodstream, but just the subcutaneous fat. So it's a, it's a kind of a very nice idea. And uh, there are many companies involved in this thing. And you've got to calibrate it. There are some problems. And it's an adjunct. You know, this is, this is the Medtronic thing. It's an adjunct to finger stick measurements. In other words, what they're trying to say is it's not quite as accurate as finger stick. It's not. It reads uh, too high when it's too low. It reads too low when it's too high. But in the mid-range, it's pretty accurate. And I believe... Uh, we, uh, they believe, too. The engineers believe that it will be able to do this and will be able to beat human beings. The human monitor is at a tremendous disadvantage in that the human monitor is uh, not paying attention, whereas the sensor uh, in the closed loop system, it's called closed, right now we're in an open loop system, basically the uh, human being is warned when you go too high to uh, in input some uh, insulin through your pump, and when you go uh, too low, the human being is warned by a bell to start eating something or, you know, and, and it, 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 that causes big swings. Okay, control L. How do I do that? How do I do that? I need, uh, I need another one here. Yeah. Yeah, huh? Oh, yeah, that's it. That's good. That's it. Now I'm gonna. Okay, so now we want to go to, uh, no, I don't want to go to that one. Let's see. Let's get that back, that thing on the bottom. Yeah, let's go to this one. Net paper, this one. Yeah. Okay, so I want to show you what the histograms are. Nope, that's not the one. That's the one. So this is a typical, 
this is not the histogram. This is uh, the actual blood glucose readings of an individual. Of course, the name has been changed, so I don't know who it is. We have 124 such time series over a year at five minute intervals. So every five minutes, the glucose monitor takes the blood sugar level, and you see it's going like mad between 400 and 50. Why is that? Because that's when the, the bells go off and the guy is reacting to the bell. But a closed loop system could do this maybe between 200 and 80, which would be much more like what a normal human being is doing. And that's the typical this is another one you can see. Also, there's missing data. You see there was a long period of time when this particular guy uh, took off his glucose monitor. Just took it off. It doesn't do it. Of course, you can't use closed-loop control if, there's no, if, the, if the monitor is not in place. And that is uh, very common. Uh, so there's gaps in the series. Now, if you look at the histogram of the glucose readings over a year of these three patients that I just showed you, this is the first patient's histogram, and, and he go, he's going from 50 to 500, but there were not too many times he was at 500. There were several times he was at 400, a lot of times he was at 400, and so on. And that is the histogram of the, uh, each thing. And you can see that it's not normal. But if you take the histogram of the logarithms, then it looks much more normal. It can't exactly be uh, log normal, but it's, it probably is close to log normal. And we have been thinking about why it ought to be log normal. Even if you break it up into periods when it is uh, between measurements of A1C. I have to tell you what A1C is. Uh, now, how do I, how do I, how do I, uh, oh, escape, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so now I gotta talk about A1C, there you go. So A1C is defined, th here's where probability and math comes into the picture. First, I have to tell you what A1C is. Sometimes it's called HbA1C. I, I don't remember what A1C stands for, but here's, here's what the idea is. At any given time, some fraction of your red blood cells have accumulated in the hemoglobin molecule that's in the red blood cell. Hemoglobin, of course, delivers oxygen. Uh, two cells, and oxygen is the other half of the equation. You need sugar and you need oxygen in the cell to function. And the hemoglobin molecule exists in two forms, oxified and deoxified. It picks up oxygen in the lung, then it becomes oxyhemoglobin. It goes to the cell and it gives up the, the uh, oxygen in the cell and it becomes deoxyhemoglobin, but it's it's a, a very important part of life. The, uh, now, the hemoglobin molecule, because it's in a sugar bath, becomes glycosylated or glycated with, or crudded up with a sugar molecule. And that sugar uh, molecule, I mean, it's good that bl red blood cells do that because that enables you to simply look at the fraction of red blood cells that have been glycated, and that would tell you how much in control the individual has been. And it's even better because red blood cells turn over, and they die every 120 days on average, uh, depending on uh, the type of person. I mean, it's a little bit shorter for hormonal teenagers and for pregnant uh, women, but let's pretend that everybody has the same uh, lifetime for their red blood cells. So when they die, they, the, the new red blood cell will not be glycosylated. So you can measure, uh, typically a, a diabetic will be measured every 
uh, three months or four months for how, what fraction the red blood cell, of their red blood cells uh, are glyca glycosylated. And they do that with a centrifuge and a chemical analysis. I want to do it, and I'll tell you why, uh, from the blood glucose readings directly. And there's going to be a big advantage to being, to being able to do this. I'm sorry this slide is hard to read, uh, but uh, let me just read it to you. So A1C, you can think of as the probability that a particular glucose, uh, that a particular hemoglobin molecule has been sh uh, glycosylated, has absorbed a sugar, uh, a, a molecule of sugar, and is now crapped up. And you would like to get a formula for that probability as a function of time in terms of the blood sugar levels that you have. Let's say we want to get that. We do. Oh, great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, suppose, for simplicity, that red blood cells live an exponentially distributed lifetime. Unfortunately, human beings do not live exponentially distributed lifetime, and there's no reason to assume that red blood cells do, but let's pretend. It makes it, it math a little simpler. Yeah. And let's suppose that the mean lifetime is 120 days. That's for sure. So gamma is the parameter, 1 over 120. Focus on one hemoglobin molecule born at time zero. And suppose at any time t, this person has a blood sugar level of B of t milligrams per deciliter, milligrams of sugar per deciliter of blood. If the hemoglobin molecule is still alive at time t, it gets glycated with probability b of t alpha dt. Alpha is some constant, which uh, let's say is independent of people. We'll be able to do everything, get a formula for a1 of t. Alpha has funny units, blah, blah, blah. We can think of a1c of t over 100 as the probability that a given, because it's a percent, uh, hemoglobin molecule is glycated. So let pi of t be the probability that the hemoglobin molecule is glycated before time t. And since it has to be alive, uh, it ha has to be alive at the time of it got glycated. So we can write pi prime of t dt, which is just dp of tau g less than or equal to t, it has to stay alive, so it's e to the minus gamma t, means it's still alive. It has to not be glycated yet, so that's 1 minus pi of t minus, which I'll write just 1 minus pi of t, assuming it's continuous. And then it has to get glycated in that instant of time, which is b of t alpha dt. And that gives you a differential equation, which you can solve. And there it is down there. Uh, log of 1 minus p of t is, is that. So you can actually write down the answer. Namely, pi of infinity, which is a1c, is 100 times this integral. Uh, uh, this integral, b of s, that's for the particular individual, the diabetic, who's not in good control and has his b his, his blood sugar readings all over the place. But a normal human being, we can assume, basically, is always uh, got, well, first of all, a normal human being, if you, if you check how, to see how much of his, molecule, uh, his hemoglobin molecules are glycated, you'll find it's about 5%. So even normals have, we're paying a little bit of a price. Now, uh, that's an indication that, uh, well, that's the way it works. So we can determine alpha from that. And that gives us a completely closed form formula for A1 uh, of T. So that's good. So now we know, and now here comes the punchline. Maybe it's here. Okay. Okay, how do I get to the full page thing again? Let's do that. Yeah. 
There you go. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So now let's go ahead with this. So now here's the real problem that I'm working on. I really don't want to make that algorithm. I, be I believe intuitively that the algorithm is not the important thing. It's going to be really easy to beat the human manager. I believe if we just drip, drip, drip the insulin in slowly and don't use any boluses at all, but pay attention to when you do that, I think we'll keep the guy in good control. And that's what the engineers at Medtronic believe also. They're looking for a very simple algorithm. So the algorithm, we believe, is not going to be the, the important thing. What we need, and what they uh, want me to deliver, is a method of proving that. A method of proving that a simple algorithm, like whenever you're above 200, dribble, dribble in some insulin, but otherwise don't, uh, and you have to maybe play a little bit to find out how much insulin to dribble in, but something really simple. Or maybe if you're above 200 and you're not falling too fast, dribble in some insulin, which is a standard control theory uh, algorithm. Control theory is very hard here because it's in subcutaneous fat. The insulin doesn't go directly into the bloodstream, so it takes about an hour to get through the fat into the, into the bloodstream. So, but you want to do it in small quantities. You don't want to put enormous <coughs> quantities in there. So we, we, that's the way we're thinking. But we need a method to prove, now prove means, of course, to the FDA for approval, and it means to the endocrinologists of the world who are going to complain that you really need human intervention here and so on. So it's important to be able to convince people, and of course in order to convince people you've got to convince yourself first, that it's true that an A1C of something like six would be obtained with a closed loop system. Six or seven, that would be an enormous improvement because you relieve the tediousness of monitoring finger sticks or whatever, and yet, and you still got a good A1C, so you're not paying the, the cumulative damage of having really high level of sugar in your blood and getting glommed up in your capillaries, and that's causing the damage. You want to avoid that. So, We've already made, the, I've, I've already indicated that you can use mathematics a little bit to get some insight into what's going on. But here's the real punchline in mathematics. What we need to do is take the, uh, I don't have to go back, those, those wi extremely wiggly things, the, the B of G, and we have to create a new time series of B of T's that would have been the case if one algorithm or another algorithm, perhaps the PID algorithm that I just described, or some other algorithm that people are advocating, there are many uh, algorithms around, what if that were in control of that patient? Now that data was taken in 2006. So how do you get what would have happened? Well, it's very easy if you break a few rules. What you do is you just take a segment that, let's say, the algorithm wants insulin put in now. But insulin wasn't put in until a little bit later. Well, you just throw that part of the time series away, and you go to this thing. And the chronologists scream bloody murder. The hormonal situation is completely different. You've skipped over an hour of time. Things have changed, blah, blah, blah. And it's true. But I believe that it will work, and it will become statistically provable that it works. You'll get the right answer. And this will get us into... Uh, once we convince ourselves that it works, we'll do it. Okay, so now what we do is after we throw away those segments of the blood sugar glucose, the frozen B of, B of T's that would have uh, 
uh, that, what, that were actually observed and move over to the new B of T's, when the insulin actually was uh, input, what we will get is a, new bl uh, is a new time series. That new time series will now represent what would have been observed if the algorithm, rather than the human open loop control, was in place. We would now observe what the what the time series of blood glucose measurements would have been under the algorithmic, the given algorithmic control. And since we've already determined from our formula that I just showed you with the differential equation and all that stuff, what the blood glucose, what the A1C would be, we can calculate that on the new uh, time series. And then we can assign an A1C not to the patient, but to an algorithm. I'm using sort of an ergodic theorem that it really, that it, you can skip all, you can throw away whole sections of the time series in order to move ahead. Now, I, perhaps things like this could be done with neural nets or without thinking about the problem in some blind way.